What do you think of when you hear best FNAF fan game? You might think of the joy of creation, day shift at Freddy's, maybe even Candies, Pop Goes, or the glitched attraction. For me, though, I instantly think of the One Night at Flumpty's series. I don't believe any game beats it. It's an amazingly stylized visual masterpiece. Its gameplay is well crafted, its characters are likable, and it knows exactly how much to take itself seriously. In this video, I'm going to explain to you why I believe the One Night at Flumpty's games are the best Five Nights at Freddy's fan games that have ever been made. The game's developer, Jonachrome, was born on June 30th, 1994, and he started animating and illustrating on Flash at just 10 years old in 2004, and joined Newgrounds, a website especially popular for sharing such creations. He would then begin his game development career with Riddle School, and he'd make many other games as well. Some of you might be unaware of this, but Flumpty and Birthday Boy Blam have origins far preceding the game that they're actually featured in. Their actual point of origin would be a comic that he and his friends made for fun. The idea was that using MS Paint, one person would draw a few panels and then pass it on to the next person. From there, the process would repeat until a semi-cohesive narrative was put together. The version of Birthday Boy Blam that has the top hat and monocle was originally a completely separate character named Kevin Jr. The way that Flumpty came along for the first time was a comic where Flumpty buried both of them because they were conveniently lying unconscious in two pits that had gravestones near them. Flumpty was able to summon the shovel he used to bury them from thin air, and thus began the narrative that Flumpty was a character immune to the plot and could transcend time and space. The reason why Jonachrome decided to make him that way was because it was the only reasonable explanation for why he could do the things that he did. A few months after the release of Five Nights at Freddy's in August of 2014, Jonachrome would find himself intrigued by the indie horror game, and he decided as a sort of inside joke among friends that it would be pretty funny if he made a fan game called Five Nights at Flumpty's. Upon seeing Five Nights at Wario's, he figured if a FNAF fan game with an absurd premise like that could exist, why not Flumpty's? He then spent the next few weeks turning this joke into a reality. Jonachrome was already a huge fan of the original FNAF formula, so because of that, the first game's gameplay loop is pretty similar to that of Five Nights at Freddy's. Early in the development, Jonachrome had decided to reduce his scale and go with the idea of one night at Flumpty's. He wanted to capture the feeling of playing Slender, where the game restarted from scratch every time you died and got progressively harder, nearing completion. He also wanted a chance to differentiate himself from other FNAF fan games at the time, since it wasn't really a popular idea to do just one night. And because of all of this, he had to make sure the game's balance and difficulty curve worked. And I think he achieved it. The characters all have very specific roles in the game's balancing. Flumpty and Blam are active immediately, basically, and Flumpty fittingly has the ability to teleport to any location he wants, following no set path. Flumpty inhabits the left door like Bonnie in FNAF, and Blam the right door like Chica. The Redman is a special case. He sort of recycles the idea behind the kitchen in Five Nights at Freddy's. For the first half of the night, Cam 3 has no video feed. However, at 3am, he begins to move, revealing that the room was actually volcanic the whole time. Because of this subtle inclusion on this other character's newspaper, the visual of the room and the specific use of the red color on the glitched camera feed, the game is designed to let you know who the Redman is before you even have to worry about him. 
For anyone that had noticed this massive gaping hole in the wall across from where the player is seated, uh, come 4am they'd now be met with a face staring back at you. This is Grunkfus the Clown, which is the first name that came to Jonacrum's head when he had to think of one for the character. Originally, he had wanted to employ a similar mechanic using Ronald McDonald's picture on the left side, but he didn't go through with that idea, because Grunkfus is totally the better clown. It isn't incredibly obvious right away, but after a few camera flips, most people would be able to get the gist that he gets closer every time. This is an excellent and unique way to balance the camera usage. Because not only does it encourage you to flip up the camera sparingly, but it also encourages you to get as much use out of every flip as possible, since the amount of time you spend in the camera isn't actually relevant. The eyes of Cam 5 are meant to serve as an indication of exactly how many camera flips you have left, but that fact isn't really communicated to the player, and this is probably the only shortcoming this game has. But in my opinion, it's not really much of an issue, since the 30 camera flips that you're given once he shows up are more than enough to complete the night. The Beaver was a character idea given to him by a friend, and he was added as a substitute for Foxy. He leaves the toilet when he runs out of TP, and it's hard to spot since he's pretty quick in his animation, but his feet are made of knives. The newspaper that he can be seen with that I mentioned earlier actually serves as a little insight for what little backstory the game has. Flumpty kidnaps person because he felt like it is a headline that refers to you the player, at least probably. You see, just as this is a game to the player, it's a game to Flumpty as well, a form of entertainment. He's kidnapped you and placed you into Flumpty's house of horrors, and supposedly if you survive the night he'll become his best friend. Jonachrome even went on to say in a developer commentary that the reason why the doors stop Flumpty is because of a self-imposed limitation, so that he can have more fun, otherwise it would be too easy for him to just kill you. The newspaper also references the Redman with the Man Drinks Lava and Lives Kinda headline. Uh, fun fact, the Redman is a character that Jonachrom previously had wished to incorporate into a different horror game that he never finished. He decided to recycle it for this game. The other half of the newspaper is mostly used to convey the Beaver's game mechanics, and also has a cheeky reference to Markiplier, who is actually the reason why Jonachrome developed his interest in Five Nights at Freddy's in the first place. For the last character in this game, he decided to make a similar easter egg to Golden Freddy in the form of Golden Flumpty. He acts pretty much exactly the same as Golden Freddy does, you just need to flip up the camera to make sure that you don't get jump scared. A few other gameplay ideas were thought of, but not implemented, such as being able to honk Ronald McDonald's nose, music playing at certain points, and even a phone call in the middle of the night. He also considered making a second night that would be the same, but just harder, but he ultimately decided against that idea. Little did he know that this idea would merely be shelved and revisited quite soon. Long story short, the gameplay is great. Maybe not too original, but super polished and well executed nonetheless, especially compared to other fan games around this time. But if that were all this game had to offer, well, I probably wouldn't have made this video. As an artist myself, I find myself enamored by the game's artistic direction. Most Five Nights at Freddy's fan games tend to go in the direction of vaguely imitating the visual style of the original and Scott Cawthon's art style, with 3D characters and environments in a dark, grungy setting. However, Jonachrome was already an experienced 2D artist and animator prior to making this game, so the 3D approach wasn't really necessary. The color composition of all of the areas and the character designs are nothing short of brilliantly done. Even though the characters already existed before the game, at least Flumpty and Blam did, uh, their simple, seemingly kid-friendly character designs were almost purposely built just for an indie horror game in the post-Five Nights at Freddy's era. As a sort of self-imposed artistic limit to challenge himself, he decided that he wouldn't use the color green anywhere within the game's characters or environments. 
This, of course, did not apply to the interface, as he cites he kept the door buttons, the usage bar, and the camera icons like that for the sake of being similar to the original Five Nights at Freddy's. This self-imposed limit can be most obviously seen in the blue cactus sitting on the desk. By the way, everything in the office was put there by suggestions from a friend, and as you can see there are a plethora of outside references to be seen. Upon completing the night, you don't actually reach 6am, uh, you, you reach ham. Following the inevitable stress that would be the latter hours of the game, you're treated to a happy-go-lucky, bright and colorful credits sequence showing all of the game's characters, and then the game is over. Now, this is a trend with a lot of the earlier Finance at Freddy's fan game developers, but Jonochrome did not expect people to like One Night at Flumpty's as much as they did. Even though it might be obvious to us the quality of even the first game, to him it was, at the end of the day, a joke game. He figured since people wanted a sequel, he might as well start thinking about making another one. The problem was, he didn't have any solid gameplay ideas. He didn't like how similar the first game was to Five Nights at Freddy's, and if he was going to take things a bit more seriously this time, he wanted to come up with more original ideas. While staying at a relative's house, he had a nightmare, where he was sitting in a garage with a light switch next to him. There was a hallway in front of him, and monsters would occasionally walk past the door. One time, he left the light on, and the monster charged at him abruptly, and he woke up. Sound familiar? This dream was the basis for One Night at Flumpty's 2. The development for the sequel wasn't nearly as easy this time around. There's definitely a whole other conversation to be had about the mental health of artists and creators, and how outside pressure can completely change your perspective and approach to a project you'd like to complete. The first game was made as a joke that nobody but his friends knew about until the game came out, and it was simply a parody of something that he kinda liked, made for fun and nothing more. But the second game came with a haunting concept. Expectation. The problem was further exacerbated when Jonochrome played Five Nights at Freddy's 2 for the first time, partially through the early development stages of the game, and he realized that a lot of his ideas weren't as original as he'd hoped, and neither were they as intuitive as he'd hoped. There were also a few aspects of Five Nights at Freddy's 2 that he didn't like, and wanted to avoid, if possible. Originally, the characters were going to kill you the moment you made a mistake with the lights, and the clown, Grungfist, was going to act like the puppet and the music box. However, he knew both of these mechanics would immediately make the game lean towards being unfair, and he also knew that the music box trope was already overdone, and I'm sure everyone has their reservations over that type of mechanic in FNAF games. He also wasn't a fan of how difficult Five Nights at Freddy's 2 was. It was so heavily weighted towards quick reaction time, and one mistake on later nights could just kill you. He wanted to avoid this, but he didn't know exactly how to, and would end up taking a short break from development in order to sort out his ideas. And he had another dream. This time, it was a Super Mario Sunshine 2 dream, for some reason, according to him. Every time Mario was seen by the enemies, a bar in the corner would slowly rise, and this was directly implemented into the game in the form of the exposure meter, and it solved all of his balancing problems almost entirely. This was evident in the fact that once he actually played the game in full for the first time to test it, he was surprised at just how well it already worked. It only needed minor adjustments, especially for the newly added second night, hard-boiled mode. 
Since the exposure meter could never go down, he still kept the tension for the end of the night that would normally be created by a lack of remaining power. Another thing that he didn't like about Five Nights at Freddy's formula, in general, was how unimportant the cameras actually tended to be in retrospect. He also wasn't a fan of how most of the animatronics in the second game would attack you and ultimately be dealt with in near identical ways. Because of this, he went in with the philosophy that every character had to serve a completely unique gameplay function, and he incorporated many of these functions using the camera so as to kill two birds with one stone and make that actually useful. The Redman from the first game returns in a pretty simple way. This time, he's a virus pop-up on your computer's screen and slowly the progress bar will build over time, and if you spend too long and not click on it, you'll die. The Owl, who has replaced the beaver from the previous game because he fell into a toilet and died, also needed to be checked on. He was a more unique take on the Foxy-type character in that he could come from two different sides, and only one vent can be covered to prevent him from getting in your room at a time. This came after a suggestion that Jonochrome got from his first game, to allow the beaver to come from either side, and turning off the light doesn't affect the owl like the other characters, since owls can see in the dark. The owl becomes active immediately, so the player can learn how they work before things get too hectic, and they are slightly more likely to appear in the open vent. This time around, Grunkfus operates on a timer that you can only keep track of if you view his camera. Because he's much closer to you when he enters the office than the other characters peeking out of the hall, he makes your exposure meter rise faster than most of the characters, so checking on him is very integral. Since the game runs at 30 FPS, every 30 digits on the timer actually equates to one second. He isn't active immediately, but you can tell when he shows up, because the hole, eerily similar to the one from the first game, appears on your left. Checking the cameras is also beneficial for the other characters for the same reason. Of course, you can just rely on your reaction time to reflexively turn the light off when they appear. However, this will almost always be slower than already knowing their position and will result in your exposure meter rising, at least by a little bit. Flumpty has a random pattern, like the first game, and has a 15% chance to appear in your office upon any random teleportation. Because of this randomness, Jonochrome added a small peekaboo animation that serves as a delay so you actually can react to him. To me, this also feels like it might be referencing the fact that Flumpty would prefer to have a self-imposed challenge to make things more interesting and fun for him. Blam, on the other hand, runs on a fixed path and is pretty normal and expected. If you remember the pit of eyes from the first game you may know about Eyesore, believe it or not, Eyesore didn't exist in the first game at all. It wasn't meant to be a character, it really just was a pit of eyes. However, Jonochrome wanted to turn it into a character because so many people thought it was one and after some struggle, he eventually settled on a design that depicted the past victims of Flumpty amalgamated into one fleshy meat being. He becomes active at 4am and then makes his way out of the pit and through cams 3 and 6 to make his way to your office. He raises the exposure meter much faster than the other characters, which is probably because he has 20 eyes instead of 2. The final character is Golden Flumpty, who acts exactly the same as he does in the first game, the only difference being that you can also turn off the lights to get rid of him. He had originally planned to make another character that was blind, but very sensitive to sound. The idea was that you'd have to not make noise when it passed the office, but in execution it ended up being too different from the other characters and interrupted the already near-perfect gameplay loop too much. As a result, this concept was shelved. Although it might seem a little redundant for Jonochrome to have added a second night in a game called One Night at Flumpty's, he was simply curious to see what the players would do with a harder difficulty. And 
Originally, he didn't do this because he didn't want to add a game mode like that to a game that was pretty much just recycled ideas, but obviously this time around, they were mostly original. He even made sure that hard-boiled mode was possible by beating it himself, and even said that he wouldn't release the game at all if he couldn't. I believe the art direction in this game is actually stronger than that of the first game, despite only being released a few months later. I think the quality of the drawings and animations increased substantially between the two games. He called upon the same friend that gave him suggestions for what to put in the office the first time, but this time he came up with a lot of it himself. Just like the previous game, he employed a self-imposed limitation for his art direction, and this time the goal was to avoid the color blue. This is why the whale on the floor is green. The lack of blue makes for an overall warmer colored environment, mostly being composed of reds, oranges, and yellows. The cheeky references to other media and Five Nights at Wario's are really nice to see, and the ABD 1 2 Pi outside the office in the corridor are pretty funny. The environment and characters are so well illustrated, it adds so much to the atmosphere of the game. The original Flumpties had been made as a parody, but this time around he likened Flumpties 2 to more of a tribute to Scott Cawthon, and his amazing hard work on Five Nights at Freddy's in general. The songs coming from the record player were both composed by Jonochrome himself, one playing on the normal night and the other playing on the hard-boiled night. The second one is actually a cover of the Toreador March, which I'm sure all of you know is the music box song that plays when the power runs out in the original Five Nights at Freddy's. and this ties back to his idea of giving tribute to Scott's work. The first two Flumpties games only had a few months apart in their release, but after the second game, Jonochrome would take a short break. Once Five Nights at Freddy's 4 was announced, he saw the hype that the community had and figured that now was as good a time as ever to consider making another game. He then announced one week at Flumpties. He put a lot of time and energy into this, but he quickly realized that he didn't really actually want to make this game. He made the decision to continue making it anyways, and his mental health and motivation exponentially deteriorated as a result. He managed to program the entire map system, drew 16 rooms, and drew Blam 19 times, and only then did he realize that the way that he designed the gameplay was inherently flawed. You see, the game was designed around being able to block off certain hallway paths, and he didn't realize until it was too late that it was ridiculously easy to just use this to trap the characters in a spot where they could never hurt you. This wasn't like him, not at all. We know from both games that Jonochrome is an excellent game designer, even when he has to come up with his own ideas. The second game was arguably the best put together FNAF fan game of all time at that point, so why did he make such a critical error and not realize it until so much time and effort had been put into the development? The answer is simple. His heart was never in it in the first place. He had two options. Finish the game and disappoint himself, or cancel the game and disappoint everyone else, but save himself. Originally, he had obviously chosen to purposefully find out if he could still make an enjoyable game if he wasn't enjoying working on it, something he had never done before, and it didn't work. For the sake of his mental health, he chose the latter. With the second game, Jonochrome was able to keep his cool and maintain a level head during development because he had so many clear ideas. He wanted to improve upon the shortcomings of his first game and the bits of Scott's formula he didn't enjoy to create the perfect Five Nights at Freddy's. He succeeded with the second game, but with one week at Flumpties, he had already grown tired of these characters. The community seemed to care about them far more than he ever did. 
They were always meant to just be jokes, and in his mind they never stopped being just that, jokes. Something not meant to be taken so seriously. He even tried to come up with a solution for his mindset. He would make the game more serious and force lore. But this goes against everything the first two games stood for. They were unique in the fact that they never tried to sell you on any convoluted lore or story. They stood out from other FNAF fan games because of that fact. You can't try to turn something into what it isn't and expect for it not to get even worse. Honestly, he probably just wanted to move on with his life already, and this is a toxic relationship that permeates many creators' lives that feel like they're stuck, and that something that they don't even care about is what got them their popularity and what people seem to care about the most. Without a clear goal and lack of motivation due to not caring, being a creator is just impossible. The expectation becomes a weight too crushing and heavy to bear. So the game was cancelled, and he didn't want to, but he had to. With a sour taste left in the community's mouth, months passed. The months turned to years, and it seems like Jonochrome was done, and Fumtis was gone. It's August 2020. Jonachrome performs a routine check of his email. Due to the incessant, obnoxious emails asking him about Flumpties and why he cancelled the game, Five Nights at Freddy's in general, all that, he has a filter that sends anything related to these things straight into the trash. However, on this fateful day, he finds a particular email sitting in his trash bin. It's from Scott Cawthon. He's been invited to the Fazbear Fanverse Initiative, a project Scott Cawthon arranged for high-profile fan game creators to receive extra support in the form of funding, merch, ports, and, and more. And Jonachrome was invited, under the condition that he wasn't even required to make a third game if he didn't want to. This was perfect for him. So what did he do? He made a third game. In a familiar scenario, his basic idea for the gameplay loop came to him in a dream, though it was much less direct this time. In this dream, he was sitting in a cabin in the mountains during a snowstorm, with four doorways on all sides leading to the outside. Flumpty and Blam would appear in the doorways and leave if he looked at them. Obviously, this couldn't be directly translated into the game, but he liked the idea of the game taking place in a cold environment, so the office turned into a freezer, and the temperature mechanic was introduced. The game actually recycles a major game mechanic from one week at Flumpty's, that being the camera flash. Originally, you were going to be able to use it on the cameras themselves, but now you can only use it in the office, and it is your sole defense against the characters in the game, with limited uses. I believe this mechanic is honestly really neat, and fitting for a horror game. The idea of shining a light down a pitch black hallway to reveal a monster on the verge of attacking you is conceptually horrifying. And it gets even more horrifying when you consider the new functionality of Gronkfest the Clown, who starts in a room that could be considered a clown art gallery. But once he moves out of the way of the sign, you can gather that this is the one character that you should absolutely not take a picture of. This introduces a whole new layer to the camera mechanic and prevents you from blindly using it to repel any danger. Now, for anyone who was paying attention, you may remember earlier when I said that he wasn't a fan of the music box mechanic, and the temperature meter basically acts like that on a surface level, but his main intent with the furnace was to create an area that seemed safe at the beginning, but was dangerous later on because of the red moon. In this game, he seems to be in a volcanic room very similar to the first game, but sometimes he will actually give you a message that you cannot go to the furnace. He travels from the room down through the furnace and out of it, killing you, 
if you make a wrong move. This is pretty fitting considering his first appearance and backstory has to do with these extremely hot temperatures. Blam is, like usual, the plainest character in terms of behavior. Just like the previous games, he follows a fixed path and turns into Kevin Jr. when he's just about to enter your office. Golden Flumpty serves the same purpose as the other games, being a hallucination, but he actually acts more like the Phantoms from Five Nights at Freddy's 3. Because of this, he's more of a distractor and an annoyance than anything else. Since this was meant to be the final Flumpty's game, Jonochrome knew that he had to bring back both the beaver and the owl. Originally, he really wanted a way to implement both characters independent of each other, and this is obviously difficult since they function the same. To combat the issue, he tried to implement them with unique mechanics, maybe even making them come from two different sides, but ultimately, everything felt too unnatural to him. He decided the best course of action was to consolidate them into one character, the Bee Vowel. How fantastic. To complement this, the owl now has his own gravestone, citing that he choked on a urinal. He would slowly progress through the vent until being near your office, in which you would have to use the camera flash to make him go away. The eyesore also makes his return. Because of his eyes, you can actually tell when he's in the hall, which is terrifying. He actually serves a very similar purpose to Grunkfus from the first game, as he slowly seems to get closer the more you use the cameras, but can actually be impeded using what little camera flashes you probably have left by this point. As a quick little side note, uh, he actually attempted to implement the blind character that he shelved in Flumpty's 2's development, but he couldn't put him in this game organically either, it just interrupted the gameplay loop too much. He decided to scrap the character and potentially use it for a theoretical future horror project. Although I personally prefer the look and feel of the second game, I think this game has overall the strongest art direction and composition. There was no self-imposed color limitation this time around, but you can tell that he was mostly going for a composition based on temperature contrast, which obviously complements the literal temperature difference between the freezing office space and everywhere else. Most of the rooms will use saturated warm reds, yellows, and oranges, giving off a warm feeling. However, every time you put down the camera, you're greeted to cool, to saturated blues, whites, and grays, giving off a cold, freezing feeling. Aside from the furnace room, of course. Now, you may have been wondering, what about Flumpty? I mean, you talked about every other character, but he's the main character. Don't you worry. Flumpty is here. He's always been here. Ever since the very first game, Jonochrome had considered making all of the characters variations of Flumpty. Flumpty is the main character, of course, and he's also the most horrifying. He's immune to the plot, and he can transcend time and space. Doesn't that just make him a god? Even when clearing the beginning of the game for the first time, you might be excited at first, but in the back of your head, you know something is wrong. Flumpty was missing from the entire game. Quickly, many other Flumpty variations also appear, taking the place of the friends that he massacred in cold blood. Throughout the night, the difficulty gets progressively harder. New features and mechanics are added with an almost comically timed horror, and you panic. You have no idea what's going on. In about the second half of the night, the UI starts to be untrustworthy, with values being displayed, clearly not correctly. The color composition has actually swapped. 
Now the office uses purples, reds, and browns, especially with the introduction of the laser doors, but the corridors have swapped temperatures. They now use mostly cold, blues, greens, whites. As you get closer to completing the night, an electro swing song performed by none other than Flumpty Bumpty himself begins to play. The song, although rather cheerful, kinda just serves to make the gameplay even more intense and distracts you. As a quick easter egg, I do want to incorporate some basic music analysis for anyone that might not have noticed, but this part of the song is actually just the 6am chimes written slightly differently. Once the song comes to a melancholic end, a cutscene plays. You won. But at what cost? It almost feels like playing into Flumpy's hands is a safer bet than whatever is going on outside. But you don't have time for that, because the game's done and the credits are happy! Hooray! The game does come with a hard-boiled mode, which the first game also received in the new ports, so now every game has one. This mode focuses on having a more difficult version of the game's first night, so Flumpty Night is more of the ultimate climax, while hard-boiled mode is more of an add-on. For the sake of this night, Jonachrome composed a classical remix of Swan Song No. 4, Serenade, which you may recognize more easily as the Shadow Bonnie FNAF 3 minigame song. The reason why he did this is actually a little deeper than it might seem. As I mentioned earlier, the original One Night at Flumpy's was actually made as a joke because of a passing interest in FNAF, but this was mostly because of Markiplier. As of Flumpty's 3, Jonachrome didn't really care about Five Nights at Freddy's anymore, and he ultimately believes that the first three games were the best ones, and that the story probably should have concluded there, in his opinion. His cover of the song is meant to draw a parallel between where he believes Five Nights at Freddy's ends, and where One Night at Flumpty's also ends. In my opinion, One Night at Flumpty's perfected the Five Nights at Freddy's formula. As an artist myself, I am definitely biased towards the very well-illustrated hand-drawn graphics, but the simple effectiveness of the character designs and the environments really shows how great of an artist he really is. The gameplay takes everything good about Five Nights at Freddy's, enhances it, and cuts out the unnecessary fat. Truly, I don't think any other fan games will ever be able to take its very specific spot in my heart. Of course, there are many other FNAF fan games and many other FNAF fan games that are excellent. One of these fan games, like Treasure Island from the previous video, is a classic that I haven't kept up with in a long, long time. Despite that, I've gotten countless recommendations to talk about it next. Let's see what it has in store for me. That's gonna be all from me. I hope you enjoyed the video. Until next time.
I'll miss you.